Hello everyone, previously on our discussion we have tried to see about kinematics. We have defined kinematics since kinematics is a study of motion. We have also tried to see motion in different types of motion depending on acceleration. We have tried to see about a linear motion and one along one dimension and we have also tried to see about motion in a plane or two dimensional motion like a projectile and circular motion. We have also tried to see about different circles, the vertical circle and the horizontal circle. One of the good applications of horizontal circle is motion of satellites. On that we have seen about how to determine gravity at a given elevation h and orbital velocity as well. We have also tried to see about the relative velocity of objects. The relative velocity is describing the motion of something with respect to another moving object. So this is all that we have seen previously. And today we'll try to discuss about the concept of dynamics. Dynamics is one of the branch of uh, physics or mechanics which studies about motion along its cause of motion or force. We are trying to focus on force. On, a, on our previous discussion, we mainly focus on motion and motion parameters or we are mainly focused on variables like distance, displacement and so on. So let's proceed for this. So in this um, topic, we'll try to see about force. Behind the cause of every motion, there is force. Okay? The cause of motion is force and it was investigated by Galileo Galilei, the father of dynamics. And Sir Isaac Newton is actually the one which is mainly known or famous uh, due to his famous motion of equations. There are basic three laws of, about motion. So we'll try to see these laws. Sir Isaac Newton proposed the important laws and the first law of motion is known to be the law of inertia. It's also known to be the law of inertia. And it is stated as if an object is at rest, it will remain at rest. And if an object is in motion, it will continue its motion with constant velocity unless and otherwise an unbalanced force is acting on it. So this law is known to be the law of inertia or this law is known to be the uh, qualitative aspect of force. It tells us that force is the one which is responsible for the change of states of objects. Meaning if an object is, remains at rest, means if its velocity is zero, if its velocity is zero, it will remain zero unless and otherwise an unbalanced force is acting on it, the object is at state of rest, it will remain at rest. If an object is in a state of motion, it will continue its motion. But the change of state appears if and only force exerts on them. The object moving in a state of motion can be converted into a state of rest if there is a force. If an object is at state of rest, for it to be moving and continue its motion, there will be an exertion of force. So force is the one which is responsible for the change of state. State is changed due to the force. This law is known to be the Newton's first law of motion or it's known to be the law of inertia. Inertia is actually, it's a very important term or quantity used to describe the property of massive body. For a given massive body, 
it has a nature or a tendency to continue state. If it is in motion, it has a tendency to continue its motion. And if it is at rest, it has a tendency to remain at rest. Force is the one which enables to change this uh, property. So the higher the mass, we do have higher inertial property. If the mass is higher, it has a tendency to continue its motion if it is in a state of motion. And uh, if it is at rest, it has a tendency to remain at rest. This is known to be the law of inertia. And it is a qualitative aspect of force in which it tells us that the quality of a force to change states. A force is the one which enables us to change states. If the net force exerted on an object is zero, so that the acceleration is zero, that means either the object is at rest or the object is in a constant velocity or having constant motion. This is what it says. And the other law is second law of motion. Second law of motion is known to be the law of acceleration. First law, or the law of inertia, we have said that the net force on an object is zero. If the net force is on an object is zero, either the object is at rest or the object is in a constant motion. What would happen if the net force is different from zero? That is a question. If the net force is non-zero, if there is a non-zero force exerted about a given object, the object will tend to accelerate. Okay? Previously, the object is either at rest or the object has a constant velocity or a constant motion. If an object has a constant motion or a constant velocity, the acceleration is zero. In kinematics, we have said that acceleration is expressed as the final velocity minus the initial velocity over time t. If the velocity is constant, if the velocity is constant, acceleration is zero. But now, if there is a non-zero applied force, if there is a non-zero applied force, and the object is in a state of accelerating. The object accelerates or tends to move. And let's try to relate this term or acceleration with that of force and mass. And this law, Newton's second law or the law of acceleration, might be stated as acceleration of a moving object is directly proportional to the applied net force. Okay, it's directly proportional to the applied net force, and it has inverse relation to that of mass of the object. So acceleration has a direct proportionality with force and inverse relation with mass. So we can relate acceleration is equal to force over mass. From this, we can have a very fundamental dynamic equation, and that is net force on a given object is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So this is known to be the basic law of dynamics or uh, the law of acceleration. Now let's try to see about the third law. We'll try to see about the third law. The third law of uh, Newton is known to be the law of action and reaction. Previously, the first law is known to be the law of inertia and it tells us about the qualitative aspect of force. And the second law is known to be the law of acceleration and it tells us about the quantitative aspect of force. It tells us quantitatively what will happen to an object when there is a non-zero net force. And uh, the SI unit of force can be given as mass times acceleration. So the mass is kilogram meter per second squared. And it's known to be Newton in honor of Sir Isaac Newton. And this is the second law. The third law is uh, known to be the law of action and reaction. The law of action and reaction tells us about the existence of force, how these two forces exist. These two forces are pair force, and these paired forces are always exist together. And one force cannot exist without the other. If there is action, there should be a reaction force. And it is stated as if a given object is tending to act like an action force, there will be a reaction force by the other object. This is what it says. Or easily it's possible to say for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This is what it says. Action and reaction force exist always in pair. These two forces always exist in pair. And they always exert on two different distinct objects. Action and reaction force always exist in pair. This is uh, what Newton's third law states. And type of force can be expressed by uh, like contact force and contact force and so on. Among the contact force, 
means contact physically with some other objects. Frictional force, normal force, drag force, and so on are considered to be the contact force. There is a contact. There are also non-contact force like gravitational force, um, force by fields like electrical field, gravitational field, magnetic field are known to be non-contact force. Among the contact force, we mainly focus on frictional force. Okay, here we mainly focus on frictional force and uh, normal force. So what is frictional force? Well, frictional force appears due to the roughness between the contact surface. If there is here an applied force on this direction, the frictional force always exists opposite to that of the applied force. And frictional force has a rule and it is known to be uh, the law of friction, which was proposed by a famous physicist, we can call it physicist as well as an artist, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And he said that frictional force is directly proportional to that of uh, normal force. Okay, It has a direct proportionality with a normal force. Frictional force is directly proportional to the normal force. And this normal force, uh, this e proportionality can be converted into equation. And this K tells us about a property of materials and is known to be uh, coefficient of friction. We call it to be coefficient of friction. Mu, uh, Greek letter mu, uh, mu, is used to represent uh, coefficient of friction. So frictional force is equal to mu times Fn. Mu is coefficient of friction. Fn is normal force. And this is a frictional force. The other contact force is normal force. Okay. What is normal force? Well, normal force is the net force exerted on a given contact surface, but perpendicularly. So the perpendicular net force exerted on a given surface is known to be normal force. Okay? It is a force which is always perpendicular to the contact surface, to the contact surface. Suppose here you have an inclined plane. So on, for this inclined plane, the net perpendicular force, this should be the net perpendicular force exerted, and that is what we call a normal force. Actually, we can have a different uh, techniques to find normal force. If you are active in finding normal force, it's so easy in finding frictional force. So previously, you have said that frictional force is expressed as mu times normal force. And we do have a different types of frictional force. We have a static frictional force, kinetic frictional force, and rolling frictional force. Actually, we mainly focus on these two, static frictional force and kinetic frictional force. A static frictional force is a frictional force exerted while the object is in a state of rest. But after it starts to move, or after it's in a state of motion, the frictional force is known to be kinetic frictional force. So the coefficient of friction can be given as mu k, meaning kinetic frictional force, and mu s is a static coefficient of friction. So this is how we determine. Now we do have different techniques in determining normal force. We can have a horizontal contact surface like this, but different force might be applied so that we can determine the normal force. For example, here you have a block and the block is just at contact surface. The only force which is exerted perpendicularly to the contact surface is the weight of the object. So the normal force is only due to the weight. In this case, it's possible to say the normal force is mass times gravity. And here, if you have a force which tends to act upward, it's try to lift it upward, and there is a downward force due to the weight, mg. Actually, the force doesn't pick it up, rather it tends to pull it upward. So what is the normal force? To find the normal force, you should have to subtract mg, which is acting downward, minus the applied force, f. The difference between the two is known to be the normal force. In this case, if you have an applied force which is acting downward, the normal force is given to be the applied force exerted here plus the weight. The addition of these two is a net force exerted on the contact surface, and that is what you call normal force, mg plus force. Here you have uh, a force exerted at some angle theta. The horizontal component of this force is called fx. The vertical component can be called as fy. The vertical component can be determined as f sine theta. The horizontal component can be determined as f cos theta. So always when you are trying to find the normal force, 
Normal force is the net force which are perpendicular. Forget about the horizontal component. To determine the normal force, you only focus on the vertical components. So the vertical component is the force due to its weight downward, the force which is exerting upward the vertical component of the force. So the difference of these two is known to be the normal force. If this force is tending to act on this direction, again you have the vertical and horizontal component. Actually the force is acting downward in this direction. So the vertical component is acting downward. You have a weight downward mg. mg plus F sine theta gives you the total perpendicular force. So for horizontal contact surface, you have different techniques to find the normal force. What if the surface is inclined plane like this? If you have an inclined plane, on this inclined plane, the normal force is the force which is total force acting perpendicular to the surface. Suppose here you have only the weight of uh, the block, the block that we have seen here. Now let's tend it to be kept on an inclined surface. On this inclined surface, you have a downward mg force. And this mg, which is the weight of the object, has the perpendicular and horizontal component. Perpendicular to the contact surface is known to be mg cos theta mg cos theta. And the parallel component of the weight is known to be mg sine theta. This mg is decomposed into the parallel to the contact surface and perpendicular to the contact surface. Then how do we determine the normal force? Well, the normal force is a force which is perpendicular to the surface, to the contact surface. Therefore, the only force is mg cos theta. So mg cos theta is a one which is known to be normal force. Here, if you have an applied force like the previous one, if you have a uh, vertical force applied here, mg cos theta is acting perpendicular to the surface. So the difference of these two gives you normal force. If the force is acting downward, you should have to add it plus. And at an angle of theta, if there is a force, you should have to find the component of this force. Okay? This is how we determine the normal force. The component of this along the horizontal and along the vertical. For example, the vertical component of this force is F sine theta. You have the perpendicular component of the weight. The weight is projected here perpendicularly, mg cos theta. So mg cos theta minus the vertical component, F sine theta. The difference of these two gives you the normal force. In this case, if the force is acting downward, you can find F sine theta, which is acting perpendicularly to the contact surface, mg cos theta is acting perpendicularly to the contact surface, so that the addition of these two is known to be the normal force. So keep in your mind that normal force is the net force exerted perpendicularly on a given surface. The surface might be horizontal or the surface might be inclined. On that inclined surface, you can have the net force. Now, let's try to see that there are also a constraint motion. There are constraint motion. Constraint motion means you can have a chained motion like this. You can have mass one here, mass two, mass three, and so on. So constraint motion is a chained motion. We can have different mass like this. Okay? Therefore, usually we are asked to find the acceleration of this system, or it's possible to ask the tension between mass and so on. Therefore, let's try to solve one good example. Let's see here. Here you have three mass. They are at the horizontal surface, and there is a coefficient of friction to be 0 0.2. To solve for such problems, like assume that, find the acceleration and the tension, and assume that here we have a pulley, the pulley is massless and frictionless. If so, to determine the acceleration of this system, this system, the first thing is naming. You should have to give name. For example, this mass, let's say that this is mass 1. You can say that this is mass 2. And you can say that this is mass 3. Here you have two chords or strings. The string between the two mass can be named as tension 1. The tension exerted between these two mass can be called as tension T2. Look here. Now, we are trying to pull this mass with 100 Newton force on this direction, there is a reaction force. It tends to react oppositely, and that force acting oppositely is on the string and at the surface. Okay? At the surface, we have frictional force of this mass 1. Let's say that frictional force 1. At this, we have the tension T1. 
And we have also a downward perpendicular force called M1G, okay, M1G. So, but this one has its own free body, so you can draw it by yourself again, or let's put it here. After it is in a state of motion, this mass is pulled by the tension exerted on this string. Okay, it has two purposes. The tension exerted here opposes this man, this mass, and it exerts the force on this mass as well. So tension one is acting to the right, and what are the forces which are oppositely reacting? Well, the tension exerted here, T2, and the frictional force exerted here or at the mass two. Okay, there will be a downward force in 2G and frictional force F2. Then it is in a state of motion as a system. So while this object is moving in this direction, the force exerted on this mass is all the tension exerted here, T2. T2 exerting on this direction. What is the force which opposes the tension? The only force which opposes is frictional force F3. We can call F1, F2, and F3. Then we can draw a uh, law of dynamics for each component. For this one, for mass one, we should have to use net force is equal to, we are talking about mass one, so mass times acceleration is the law of dynamics. We can have mass one A. And for the second object as well, we have net force is equal to mass two A. And for the third object, or for the third mass, we have net force is equal to mass 3a. The only difference is the net equation is mass times acceleration, but we put 1, 2, and 3 for each mass. That's all. And how does the net force exert? The net force is all due the horizontal force components. Okay? The perpendicular force components are included indirectly for a frictional force. Previously, we have defined that frictional force is mu times normal force. Therefore, to find normal force, we have to use the perpendicular force component. So in this case, whenever you are trying to ask about the net force, only think about the horizontal components, okay? Here you have applied force, which is under Newton to the right, and the two forces which are opposing are to the left. And this force is F minus, okay? These two forces are acting oppositely, T1 minus frictional force 1. These are the net force. The difference of this force gives you net force, and that net force is the one which accelerates the uh, object or the system. Is equal to mass 1A. This is your first equation. Then proceed for the second mass. This mass is pulled on the right side by tension 1 and opposed by tension 2 as well as frictional force F2. Therefore, the net force appears, tension 1 is pulling to the right, but tension T2 and frictional force 2 oppose tension T1. The difference of this gives us M2A. And here, the tension T2 is acting to the right side, but F3 is oppositely acting on this side. So therefore, we should have to subtract T2 minus frictional force F3 is equal to M3A. So we have different three equations separately for these bodies. We have a free body diagram. The free body diagram of this and gives you this equation. The free body diagram of this gives you this and this. We have three equations, three different equations. But we should have to add all these equations because these objects are in a state of motion as a system. We just use free body diagram to have equations. But at last you have to add all the equations. Now let's try to add all these equations. F minus T1 minus frictional force is equal to mass 1A. Okay? The second equation is tension T1 minus tension T2 minus frictional force 2 is equal to M2A. And the third one is T2 minus frictional force 3 is equal to M3A. Now we should have to add this. Why are we adding this? Because they are acting as a system. Okay? So whenever you add, here you have force. But when you add these two, negative tension 1 plus tension 1 is 0. Negative tension 2 and plus positive tension 2 is 0. So when you add these two, it's 0. The only thing left is the negative of frictional force 1, frictional force 2, and frictional force 3. 
So minus frictional force one, uh, you can put it in bracket by adding a frictional force two plus frictional force three. Here you should have to use bracket unless you have to use minus minus and minus. Then when you add this one, mass one, mass two, mass three, they all have a common acceleration since they are acting as a system. So you have to put mass one plus mass two plus mass three, the whole times acceleration A. Okay, you should have to put it like this. Then first let's try to determine the frictional force. We have the applied force, 100 Newton. We have the mass, okay. How do we determine the frictional force? Previously we have defined that frictional force is given to be mu times normal force. This is how we determine uh, frictional force. For mass one, we have a frictional force one. Frictional force one is equal to the static frictional force is 0 0.2 mu times what is a normal force. In this case, the only force perpendicular to the surface is due their weight. So M1G. Here we have M1G. Static frictional force is 0 0.2 times mass. The mass of this is 3 times gravity 10. So when you multiply this, you have 6 Newton. So we have 6 Newton. The frictional force 2, frictional force 2, can be given as mu times mg. The only component is mg. So coefficient of friction mu times mg, which mass m2g. Okay. So mu is 0 0.2 times mass is, the mass of this is 5, gravity is 10. So when you multiply this, you have 10. You do have 10 newton. And at last, you have a frictional force at mass 3, frictional force 3. Frictional force 3 can be determined as mu times m3g. Mu is the coefficient of friction, 0 0.2 times the mass is 2 kilogram, 2, and the gravity is 10. So when you multiply this, you can have it to be 4. Okay, You have 4 newton. So here we have 4 newton frictional force. We have 10 newton here, and you have uh, F1 to be 6 newton. Therefore, you can put all these variables to find the acceleration. Because that we have 100 newton here, 100 newton minus F1 is 6, okay, 6. F2 is found to be 10, okay, 10. And F3 is found to be 4 uh, Newton, 4. And this, here we have mass 1, mass 2, and mass 3. We have mass 1, mass 1 is to be 3, mass 2 is 5, and mass 3 is 2 kilogram. Here we have 2, the whole acceleration A. So there is nothing left. We can possibly find our acceleration. So when you add these two, is 10 A. And here, when you add these two, is 20. 100 minus 20 is 80. Over 10 gives us our acceleration. So our acceleration becomes 8 meter per second square. So acceleration of this system is 8 meter per second square. This is how we determine the acceleration of a system using the law of dynamics. Okay? And it's also possible to find the tension T1 and T2 on every equation that you have. For example, if you apply here, you have frictional force 1, you have the acceleration, it's possible to find tension 1. Or you might use this one or this one to find tension T2. It's so possible to use the equations that we have already previously found. So this is how we apply and the law of dynamics solve such problems. Please, students, try to find the acceleration of this system. So that's all that I've got for today. We'll try to see uh, different problems, and we'll proceed on the other topics next time. So bye-bye for today.